This is another chapter on the Living History Project of the Emeritus College of Emory University. We're recording on January 22nd, 2019. This project is designed to capture the recollections of a distinguished emeritus faculty over the years of their service here at Emory. It's important to record these, we believe, because their contributions may be forgotten, even though they were so important during those years that they served this university. I'm Dr. Virgil Brown, a member of the Emeritus Faculty and of the Executive Committee of the Emeritus Faculty. Our honored guest today is Dr. Nanette Winger. It's my honor to discuss with her her contributions to medicine and specifically to Emory University. Welcome, Dr. Winger. It's a delight to be here. There are three areas of your contributions I want to talk with you about today. Certainly your teaching, which you're well known for and also your focus on heart disease in women, which when you began your career was relatively ignored, and then finally the, the treatment and prevention of heart disease in the elderly. I have uh, questions for you uh, that I hope you will expand on and uh, will add to as we go through this because I may have forgotten some of the great things that you've done for this university and for medicine. First, can I'd I, like can, to... Can I interrupt you, Certainly, though? of course. Because I feel as if I'm sort of the grandmother of the Emeritus College, because in addition to being a founding member of the Emeritus College, I was chair of the Faculty Life Course Committee when the concept of the Emeritus College arose, and we carried this through the Faculty Council, through the University Senate, and to the Provost's Office. Mm -hmm. And during the eight years that I chaired that committee, this Emeritus College came into being. So I feel that this is a very cherished possession of mine. Well, we certainly agree. Uh, this is now uh, a component of this university that is uh, recognized among many other universities, and it's serving the retired faculty very well in many ways. Thank you for doing that. May we now uh, turn to uh, your teaching here at Emory. You, this will be your 60th year Correct. of teaching at Emory. Correct. You, became, you came here in 1958 as a postdoctoral fellow, as I remember, and then became a faculty member the next year in 1959. This is 2019, 60 years, amazing. For that great career, uh, let's return to your youth. What were the things that you remember that may have motivated you to go into medicine and to focus on science? Well, I grew up in New York City, but I grew up in the suburbs, and for high school, I traveled into Manhattan, which was unusual in those days. But there was a competitive school, Hunter College High School, that was open to students from the five boroughs of New York, and I gained admission. And that opened up the entire city to me because in addition to going into the city every day, I had very exciting classmates. It was an all-girls school, and I've come to value girls' education, at least at a secondary level. And we use the resources of the city. It was not unusual for us to go to the museums, uh, rarely, but attractively, to go to opera or to go to theater but we were part of a very vibrant city. And I think that it just opened unusual vistas for me. I'm sure. Although I'm a Georgian by native, I lived in New York City for 10 years and I know exactly what you're talking about. I enjoyed that very much. What about your medical education? How did that begin? Well, I was interested in science even in high school and that interest grew. I was a pre-medical major in college. Pre-med major was a luxury because you didn't have to take a minor. So all the courses were there and then there was the opportunity to do a lot of additional courses. So I expect that I got a very broad education in addition to my pre-medical major. And my advisor in college encouraged me to apply to medical school after three years of college with the comment that, well, if you don't make it the first time, you'll try it the second time. 
and I was fortunate enough uh, to be accepted into the Harvard Medical School. And uh, those were four of the most amazing years of my life. What you have to realize, Virgil, is that mine was the sixth class of women in the Harvard Medical School. Harvard was late in the array of medical schools in accepting women. And in their ultimate wisdom, uh, the Board of Overseers of the university said that women were to be in the medical school for a decade on probation to see how we did. So that only the year that my class graduated were we incorporated in the university charter. Because we weren't in the university charter, we couldn't get university housing. So the men lived in the dormitories under house rules at the time, and the women lived in apartments in town. It was totally the opposite of what you might anticipate. But my classmates were welcoming. Uh, the women all agree that uh, we felt very comfortable, we felt wanted, and we thoroughly enjoyed being exposed to the very brilliant men and few women on the faculty. I had a similar experience from the other side. I went to Yale and uh, we had four women in my class of 72 students. I hope they felt as comfortable as you did. Uh, this was in 1960 when we entered school. So yes, it was a very different period of time and uh, we made great progress in bringing women into the fold in medicine. Now they outnumber of uh, men in many aspects of medicine. The uh, professional education um, after Harvard was where? I went to the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And again, this was before the Mount Sinai Hospital had a medical school, so that all of the teaching went to the house staff. And uh, there were some of the most brilliant minds in the country at Sinai. On my rotation through pediatrics, I was exposed to Bella Schick of the Schick test. Alan Guttmacher was in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, the, they were just a huge number of people in medicine, but cardiology was one of the shining stars. Arthur Master was there, and he was followed by uh, Simon Dack and Charles Friedberg. So the, many of the greats of cardiology uh, were there. The chief of medicine, Alex Gutman, was the editor of the Green Journal. And uh, we were encouraged, even as house officers, to consider submitting manuscripts to the then famous Green Journal. And as a matter of fact, the first paper I ever published was my cardiology fellowship paper, which was required before you completed your fellowship. And that was the paper on coronary embolism that was published in the Green Journal. Mount Sinai has continued to be a great school. As you probably know, I spent 10 years as a professor of medicine there at running the uh, metabolic disease program uh, and I had a great experience. It was a wonderful program. And we, we had great people even then, perhaps not the same number of those who were so outstanding nationally and internationally as you, during your period you were there. But it was still a great department of medicine and I'm sure you had a wonderful education there. Now, while you were at Mount Sinai, what happened in your life that was otherwise important? Well, I met my then fiance and, and husband-to-be and I had planned to stay in New York. Uh, I had plans to do some study in Europe for a year and then come back to the Mount Sinai Hospital. But my world changed. And when I met Julius, he had just finished his stint in the military and had accepted a job at the Emory University School of Medicine. He was uh, recruited by Willis Hurst and we talked about Atlanta and about Emory. And you know, for most Northerners at the time, there was Boston and New York and Philadelphia and Washington, and then there was the Great Divide. And Atlanta was part of that Great Divide. And I'd never been to Atlanta. So where, after we were engaged, I came to visit Atlanta. 
I found it interesting but uncomfortable because I had never lived in a segregated society. But I agreed that as a good bride-to-be, I would try it for one year. And as you can see, it's been a very long year. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, Atlanta's changed a great deal uh, over those uh, 60 years that uh, you've been here, uh, far to the better in those respects. And uh, the university's grown greatly, not only uh, in size, but in reputation around the world. We're now an internationally known university, as you well know, and you've made a contribution to that happening. So you've made a, a real contribution in many ways uh, to this university and changed some things that uh, were not right uh, back in those days that, in which you joined us. Now, you would not only have a husband, but I believe you have a daughter we, or two. We have, we, have, we have three daughters. Three daughters. And uh, the delight of my life. Uh, I think unusual in a family of physicians where not too many children follow in their parents' footsteps. Uh, two of our three daughters are physicians. Uh, my oldest daughter, Deborah, is an ophthalmologist. My second daughter, Judy, uh, is an obstetrician. And the third daughter, the third, always the rebel, is the only non-physician in the family. And as a matter of fact, around the dinner table, she would always say that she was the only educated person in the family, that the other four of us went to trade school. And she's an historian and uh, currently serves as chair of the Department of History at University of Pennsylvania. So a highly educated and highly accomplished historian. Yeah. Well, you must be very proud of all three girls. Well, they're all happy with what they do. They're successful at what they do. And of course, what that means to me is really quite important. Because when I was a working mother in Atlanta, I was the unusual one. Women in the South didn't work unless they had to. There were very few women who worked by choice. And there were no accommodations for working mothers. So that if my children had felt neglected, I don't think they would go on to be working women. So it's essentially has validated my decision to be in medicine. Well, obviously, you were a successful mother as well as a successful physician and professor. So what led you to remaining as a faculty member at Emory? What, 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 was the, what were the things that attracted you after your fellowship was completed here? Well, remember, I had completed a fellowship in New York, but this was the time when cardiology fellowship was now expanding to two years. So I took an additional year of fellowship here under the tutelage of uh, Willis Hurst and Bruce Logue, which was, again, a great luxury. And then uh, took the opportunity to become chief of the cardiac clinics at Grady. And Grady Hospital was a major change from what I had known in New York. I had the opportunity for about four months to work at the old Grady, or the old Grady's as they were called, because there were two hospitals. There was the white hospital and there was the black hospital across the street. So I worked at the old hospital before we moved into the new structure. And the new structure, again, was a segregated hospital. It was only a couple of years into uh, being at the new hospital that the hospital became integrated. But I expect we all have a sense of core values, of things that we accept and things that we don't accept. And my core values got me into trouble, I must admit, because we had our cardiac clinic. I was in charge. And there was a public address system, which was the way patients were called into the rooms. And the standard method was that the white patients were called Mr. or Mrs. And the black patients were called by their first name. Well, the first thing I did when I took charge of the clinic is that everyone became Mr. or Mrs. And as you might anticipate, 
by the next Monday morning, I was down in the office of the hospital director, who said to me, Dr. Wenger, do you know what you've done? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, do you know that that's not the way we do things here? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, are you going to do it again? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, we're going to be friends because you're likely going to be down in the office once a week or so. <laughs> and this continued for a while. And then I think he, he realized this was the handwriting on the wall. And one middle of the day, we were going to lunch, and we walked down the second floor hallway, and he put his arm around my shoulder, and we walked into lunch together. And I think that that very simple gesture just said to everyone, don't bother reporting her anymore. Nothing is going to happen. And that problem got solved very readily. I think he, he just realized that I was probably right. We also had something else interesting because I think there was a tacit assumption that individuals who were indigent were not smart and nothing could be farther from the truth. And when I came to Grady, medications were dispensed by number. So you went to the pharmacy and you got a number three, a number seven, a number nine had no idea what it was, what they were, but that's the way they were done. And I thought this was ridiculous. I sent in my formal complaint, which I did once a month for a while. But to get around that, I started what was probably the first patient education program at Grady, in that we made cards. And we said, number threes are digitalis or digoxin. This is your heart medicine. No, and we went, we went through with the numbers, and the patients had the cards so they knew what the number was, what the drug was, and what it was for. And patients realized what it was. And after a year or so, pharmacy came around, and we finally began to dispense drugs by name rather than by number. But again, I think it was a matter of solving a problem rather than simply fighting something that couldn't be fought at the moment. Yes, it, it was a, an interesting but painful period. Uh, having lived both in the South and in the North when I was in my formative years, I saw it from both sides as well. And in fact, when we went to Mount Sinai, uh, I had uh, a 700 patient diabetes clinic in my division. And one of the things I noticed, having just come from California where this was not much of a problem, <laughs> It was much more, you know, accepted to do many other things that I had not grown up with, nor had you. And, but I noticed in our clinic, which was 45% black and 45% Hispanic, that there was very little emphasis on education, about ed exercise and other things that we had done in California. And so I said, let's, do, let's try that. And all of a sudden, to I think everyone's uh, surprise and very pleasant surprise, was that these people were following our directions. They were actually exercising, they were actually changing their diet. And so, you know, your point, well Educa taken, if you don't expect, works. yeah, if you don't expect people to, to you know, follow through with a, an educated and uh, enlightened approach, then they won't do it because you don't put in the effort. And, you know, and that effort you made there, and I think what we did in New York, uh, was an education to me uh, in what could be done. So, you know, that, that attitude at Grady obviously has been an inspiration to you, the fact that you could make change and uh, that there was something to do that was really important and you did it. Um, what else at Grady, what made you so committed for 60 years in terms of the opportunity to change cardiology and medicine? Well, I think the main thing about Grady would be the patients and they are absolutely wonderful people. Remember that Grady was not only my teaching base and my practice base, it was also my research base. And for our Grady patients, first, they trusted us enough to allow us to take care of them. This, at the time I was there, was the major teaching hospital for the Emory University School of Medicine. Most of our medical students were there. So they allowed us to teach patients 
participating in their care. And very importantly, they became participants in our research studies. And some of the major cardiovascular multicenter clinical trials that are the basis for the medications we use today were done at Grady. And we were among the highest enrollers in the country. Uh, every time there was a multicenter clinical trial, everyone came to Grady because they knew that our patients would agree to participate. They were wonderful participants in the trial. They followed through. They followed their medications. They adhered. We had lower dropout rates than almost any other place in the country. And they were very special patients. And that, I think, is the core of Grady today. Uh, the fact that the Emory University School of Medicine was there was probably the most important facet because Emory, as a medical school, continued to say to Grady, a public hospital, that we can't teach unless we can provide quality care. And therefore, the emphasis was on quality facilities, quality medications, et cetera. And the medical school went to bat with the two counties that support the hospital and subsequently with the community to see that Grady had the facilities that allowed us to appropriately teach our medical students and our residents and our postgraduate trainees. I recently, um, in, in moving, picked up from my bookshelf as we were packing, Willis Hurst's book on Emory University, a School of Medicine. And in that book, there's a letter uh, from uh, Eugene Stead to the uh, board at Emory, because at that time there was this argument as to whether Grady should continue to be part of the medical school uh, or whether the university should, hospital should be a teaching hospital, so the whole organization structure. And Stead wrote, five-page letter on why Emory should give up Grady and not be part of it. Now, Eugene Stead is known for many, many insightful developments in medicine at Duke, but that was one place I think he was wrong, and uh, you were one of those who helped make it, uh, prove it, that it was well, wrong. Well, again, Willis Hurst realized the importance of Grady as a teaching and training facility, and he advocated for it very, very strongly, and indeed, in cardiology, so did the surgeons, because a few years after I arrived, uh, Peter Simbus came as the cardiothoracic surgeon, and Charles Hatcher supported him so strongly. Grady did not have, for example, a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So expensive, it was unaffordable. And actually, Emory, I think, just had one and Charlie Hatcher would load the cardiopulmonary bypass machine into a truck, and he would come down, and he and Peter would use it at Grady, and then the machine went back to Emory. And there were a number of shared resources like that, but again, realizing that it was important to deliver quality care to our patients, and that this was an institution for teaching and training. I think that's certainly proven to be the case. It's one of the great strengths of Emory University's School of Medicine. Well, now let me turn to another one of your important interests. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, that um, women uh, having a delay in the onset of coronary heart disease and stroke seem to be ignored in many of our early clinical trials, and I was part of those. I, I remember it well. Um, but that has certainly changed over the years because we began to realize that women actually now die more frequently of cardiovascular disease than men. Of course, later in life, but the later years in life are valuable. And I, I wonder how you got, <clears throat> how, what motivated you and what were your opportunities to make a difference in women with heart disease? Well, again, in my clinics, I was seeing not only men, but women with coronary disease. Now, we're not talking about the diseases that now are essentially rare in the Americas, and that are the rheumatic diseases. And of course, with an immigrant population, we still see that at Grady. But we were seeing a lot of women with rheumatic heart disease. But here I'm talking about coronary disease, which is the scourge of cardiology. And I was seeing women on the wards 
and in my clinics, and as I went to the literature to see how best to treat them, every one of the studies was done exclusively or predominantly in middle-aged men. And as a matter of fact, in middle-aged white men. And I brought this to the attention of the American Heart Association, of the American College of Cardiology, of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And I sort of had an annual letter that I would write to the boards of directors. And finally, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute agreed to have a conference on coronary disease in women. And I was invited to co-chair it. And that workshop, original workshop, you know, when you have a workshop, it means a conference the next year. Well, it was almost, I think, a five or six year hiatus between the workshop and the conference. We finally had the conference, and again, I was invited to co-chair it. And probably what brought this to the forefront is that the summary was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And suddenly, people began to talk about coronary disease in women. And I think my major contribution was asking the questions. And when you pose a question and people realize there is no answer, that starts the research. And you know, when you look at the graphs of coronary deaths, until about the year 2000, the decline in coronary mortality in this country was solely in populations of men, and coronary mortality among women remained constant. And then, at the year 2000, there was an abrupt decline in, coronary, in cardiovascular mortality in women. And it was at the time that the studies were now coming into being that defined the prevention, the diagnosis, the management, specifically for women. And actually, uh, in 2013, 2014, for the first time since these data were collected, fewer women than men died annually from coronary disease. And as I've said, we are delighted to be in second place and we want to stay there. But it is the result of realizing that preventive strategies, many are the same, but many are different, that diagnostic methods have to be very different, and that really came to define the pathophysiology of the disease. And we realize what we've learned and now know is that whereas men predominantly have obstructive disease of their large coronary arteries, women certainly have that, but women also have non-obstructive disease that leads to morbidity and mortality. They have microvascular disease. So we're just more complex. It's amazing that it took um, almost 30 years you know, the American Heart Association, to its glory, not often uh, uh, adequately touted, is the dietary recommendations that were made in 1962 and then really published and, and pushed in 63. Um, the smoking cessation from the Surgeon General report in 1964, coronary disease continued to rise until 1968 and then it turned down, primarily because of the change in men. Smoking cessation began to start, but, but the diet, dietary change was so important at that point. And that probably helped stabilize women as well as men. But Virgil, what mm -hmm. you don't realize, I still have that pamphlet in my collection. Mm -hmm. When the American Heart Association introduced the prudent diet to the American public, the n title of the publication was The Way to a Man's Heart. Yes, that's right. But the women were getting to the man's heart, and fortunately they ate, they changed their diet as they changed their husband's diet. So I think it paid off in both sexes, but certainly men, I think, benefited more, as you point out, and, and I was trying to make that point as well. So, you know, the, many things happened. You know, we've, we've lived in a period of time where we have actually seen the things that we have worked on all our lives pay off in a very big way, the coronary decline, is amazing in terms of numbers of people who are still alive and functional, don't you think? And you've been a great major part of that. Well, the most, one of the most exciting rewards, I think, of this is that uh, just this past December, the World Congress of Cardiology was held in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to deliver a plenary lecture, but to, invited to deliver it on 
heart disease in women. So uh, to have heart disease in women as a plenary, particularly to have it in Dubai, was wonderful. Yes. Certainly the Middle East is uh, coming along as well in terms of women, I hope. Very in much ways. so. Very much so. Yeah, very good. Well, you have 1,300 publications, and a good number of those deal not only with women, but also with the elderly. And so uh, what, what focused your attention on both treatment and prevention of heart disease in our older population that's growing so dramatically? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's essentially the, the same issue uh, that as I saw older patients, I realized that for many years, the upper limit of enrollment in the clinical research studies was age 65. And then as we looked at the data, we now having Medicare, we have data on a population 65 and older. And we have lots of disease, lots of cardiovascular disease in elderly patients. And we have no research data to guide their care. And again, I started asking the same questions. We started the Society for Geriatric Cardiology, of which I was president, and we had the American Journal of Geriatric Cardiology that it was my privilege to edit for about 15 years. Now, geriatric cardiology is one of the uh, specialized councils within the American College of Cardiology and has a vibrant educational research an advocacy program. And what we're beginning to realize is that this is indeed a separate discipline. Uh, we're now seeing major differences, again, in prevention, in diagnosis, in manifestations. But more important, we're beginning to realize that the geriatric syndromes cognitive decline, frailty, et cetera, have major impact on disease and that they have to be taken into consideration. And now that we're doing personalized medicine, uh, patient preferences become very important. And as we've queried our older patients, we realize that there is no particular bent based on age. Some patients want one thing, some want the other, but we really never ask them. And I expect that some of medical care now, particularly with our older patients, involves trying to ascertain their goals of care because that really helps in the conversation of my saying, well, you know, there's, there's a new drug available for this. Shall we talk about it? And patient will, some patients will say, I feel fine, no. And some will say, well, let's try it. But you, the, some patients just want to feel better. Most patients want independence. And I think that everything we do should be structured to allowing patients to be as independent as possible. Much of that involves preventive care. And patients want to be out of hospital. If they can be independent and avoid hospitalizations and have symptom control, that's all most patients want. And most of our research studies, what do they address? Morbidity, mortality. And mortality is often not a prime concern of older people. If they're independent, if they're mobile, if they feel well, uh, that may be enough for many patients. And that should guide our conversations about testing and about therapy. I think you, you, you said a word I think that uh, physicians often forget and that's goal. You know, many physicians uh, in my experience don't try to come to, to grips with the issue of a goal, not only for the patient but for themselves with the patient. What is the communal goal between the physician and the patient in terms of these issues of uh, quality years of life? And I think that's something we, we need to focus more on our students, to get that concept together with their patient as to what you're actually trying to accomplish. Then the tools, of course, become the drugs and other aspects of care. And I know that that's exactly the way you've practiced uh, medicine over the years.
I would love to see something like this incorporated in an electronic medical record where whoever is the primary care physician or the individual who has this conversation identifies patient preferences and patient goals of care so that someone who comes to see the patient de novo, in contrast to someone who's followed them for eight, 10 years, uh, doesn't make a decision that's inappropriate or make a recommendation that's inappropriate. Now we have to find a way to put that in our medical record and I expect that if this works well in our geriatric population, it likely will go downward for the sicker patients in the younger population where we really should for these patients to define goals of care. I, I think on the other end of this thing, we also uh, are not as sufficiently aggressive in young people who have major risk factors and think that we can uh, allow them to develop into something that's treatable uh, later on in life when they become middle aged. And I think that that is a lost opportunity that we also need to work on. Would you agree with that? Again, I think some of this starts in the schools mm -hmm. and the education should be education for health. And that will involve diet, it will involve physical activity, it will involve avoidance of dangerous substances, including tobacco, drugs, etc. But that is the way health should be taught. It should be part of the school because the school lunches should be healthy lunches. There should be physical activity in the school and not just outside of school. And it should be a pattern for living that is developed as part of education. We're falling short on that. You have been involved in virtually every cardiology organization that is trying to make a difference in this world. And you've been a key player in the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, in several international organizations. And you have been recognized with honors that uh, are longer than uh, it would, uh, I would be allowed to, to present in this uh, hour long session we're having. Um, so your, your knowledge and your breadth of, uh, of uh, impact on the world is very important and continues to be important to Emory. Um, from that perspective, what do you see as the future of Emory? What should we be doing differently to address the current needs in cardiology that uh, are opportunities as well as uh, 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 problems for our patients? Well, again, as I work with the trainees in cardiology, and that is one of the luxuries of my life, is working with the trainees, I expect that listening to the questions they ask becomes one of the most important features because so many of them come to their cardiology training with very different backgrounds, some in the social sciences, some in the uh, mathematics, sciences, now some related to big data, some in genetics, some in genomics, some in all of the other omics. And all of these have the opportunity to contribute. I expect that 60 years from now, someone looking back at this will say, Virgil and Nanette, how can you have been so primitive in terms of your approach to patient care. And personalized patient care may have a specific stamp. It may have a genetic stamp. It may have an other stamp. But we will have much more specific care. What we're doing now is group care, aren't we? Yes. So I expect that that will be the case. But I expect we are already seeing a greater emphasis on prevention. I agree, and, and, uh, and you've made the point here that I think we often forget, and that is, it's very much an individual thing. We um, tend to depend on these uh, communal studies that give us an average risk uh, related to any particular factor, uh, but individuals have their own particular take on risk, and it requires some insight on the part of the physician to actually pull out the true risk that needs to be managed in a patient. And I've heard that from you, and, and I think that's so important that we need to teach our young people the, uh, those facts. Would you agree? 
Absolutely. Well, again, facts change. Yes. That that's that's really the excitement of of the of the research endeavor, and the emphasis of Emory as a research university is really pervasive. But what we have to do and what we have to bring into the medical school, I think, is more of the social sciences, more of the behavioral sciences. We are going to have to learn more of the legal sciences because that is going to impact everything that we do. So I expect that we will be seeing more of the cross-college emphases within the university. Some of the Emory grants now, the, the, the institutional grants, involve at least two departments or two schools, et cetera. And that, that's the beginning of this emphasis, that we have such resources within the university that we're not using for teaching and learning that we have to do this cross-fertilization across the colleges. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today and to hear your take on so many things that you've done over your tremendous career. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure.